Welcome, everyone. We're so glad that you're here and joining us. I'll just into the space. All right, we will be recording today's uh, webinar. I'm excited to uh, introduce Christina Yang. Um, today, we're going to be talking about how do we make art with people, places, and things with curator uh, Christina Yang, a former BAMPA chief curator. Um, she engages in an open-minded, behind-the-scenes um, conference. She, oh, oh, I'm reading this, and <laughs> I didn't prepare. Um, yes, we are going to be doing a very open-ended conversation with me, Lisa Weimar, the uh, co-teacher of this class, and Greg Niemeyer will also be joining in. Um, but we're going to be talking about sometimes the sacred and profane task of curating performances in an expanded interdisciplinary practice in museums. The program today will ask um, what changes in curatorial work when, uh, what happens or what changes in curatorial work, curatorial work when bodies are foregrounded as works of art, or perhaps how traditional principles can be upheld when a person or animal is in our care or in the care of the museum. Christina Yang um, has a PhD uh, is a PhD candidate in performance studies at NYU's Tisch School of the Arts. Her previous positions include curatorial roles at the Williams College Museum of Art, the Guggenheim Museum, the Kitchen, and Queens Museum. And she is a graduate of, the, of UC Berkeley and the Williams College graduate program um, in art history. So welcome, Christina. We're so glad that you're here with us in our class, LNS 25. Um, uh, performance and the practice of performance. We're, we've done a lot of work uh, around community and curation, or community and performance, I should say. We haven't really gotten into curation at all. Um, the students have performed themselves in the museum. We've had guests, a um, wide range of guests, from authors to choreographers to theater makers to art makers and musicians. So we're so excited for this conversation with you today. And um, I think what we'll do is you were going to start with a few slides and I'll just move through them and just ask me to, to shift when you're ready. And then we're, we're going to go into conversation and we have a wonderful array of questions from our students. So I'm really glad students, I see that um, it looks like uh, almost the entire class have, have put in some really wonderful questions and we're going to be getting to those. As we talk about, you know, what performance is, how performance uh, works inside museums, and then also your perspective as a curator. I'm so curious about this, and and, and also um, curation and what curation even is for folks who are new to that concept. So I'll pass it to you, and I'll go to your first slide. Great. So thank you so much, uh, Lisa and Greg, for this invitation. And thank you to all of the students uh, who are here with us in this virtual space. Um, you know, we're in this like post vaccine time uh, and we're, but we're, you know, keeping with us some of this like amazing technology that allows us to travel time and space. Um, I guess I do wanna recognize that uh, I am speaking to you from New York City. Uh, it's the, you know, former homelands of the Lenape um, Indian tribe. I know that, you know, um, my former home and place of work and where many of you are from or work or, or you know, kind of zooming in from today is, um, I see remains, remains Ohlone, um, you know, homelands. So just want to, you know, put that out there that there's, you know, histories, many histories and many peoples with us, even in this virtual space. Um, and I'm super excited to talk to you about a couple of select projects that I've had the um, you know, absolute joy to curate and that fall under the category of performance. But I really actually want to you know, keep this very um, open and conversational with you and with Greg and with Lisa about you know, what your understanding of performance is. Because um, I mean, one of the things that was um, new for me and interesting was that when I started in a new PhD program, the you know, discipline of performance studies was this like shift from uh, not thinking about performance as like performance art, like you know, live mm -hmm. work made by artists. So not just theater and dance, music, et cetera, et cetera, perform or you know, work that's more like someone like Alison Knowles, who you 
had a chance to participate in her work in or Yoko Ono or um, Rina Abramovic, et cetera. But performance is actually, uh, as we study it, is the study of, you know, of world making, of something that constitutes change in the world. And it's, and it's really up to mm. you as the scholar, curator, uh, participant to define your own performance. Like, you know, what is, what is it that you want to focus on that is changing consciousness, you know, making an impact on the world and, um, you know, in your mind, performing in the world. So, so we might spend some time, and I hope you had a chance to read um, Dorothy von Hantelman's essay, short essay, about a brief history of, I'm sorry, how to do things with, uh, how to do things with art, which is a, uh, like a, a response to a linguist, the linguist John Austin, who wrote a, uh, who, who actually, well, he delivered a series of lectures at Harvard called How to Do Things with Words. And he was very interested in the notion of the performative, the, 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 the a word that actually enacts change. So an example of that would be uh, the judge who says, you know, to a, uh, to two people says, I now pronounce you, uh, you know, well, back in the day, you know, husband and wife or, you know, man and wife, but it could be, you know, a couple that is literally just by the judge saying that they are changed. They're now constitute a couple in the world of like, society and legal and whatever, um, you know, demonstrating to the world that they, that language changed who they were. And so, so, so that's an example of a performative and, um, right, thank you, Greg, that, that's something of a speech act, so an act of speech that creates change. So it's really that foundation that, um, is, that constitutes the study of performance. But in spite of that, um, as a curator of performance, um, I do continue to work with artists, you know, because I do think that, the, that their actions in the world are among the most interesting and the most compelling and the most original. And so um, even though many of us in performance studies do work with artists, um, you know, we take a pretty broad view of what performance is and we, there's room for anyone who's studying performance to bring their own interdisciplinary view into what constitutes performance. So it doesn't have to, so, so we, I think later we'll get into a conversation and I did see some of your questions had to do with um, art versus performance. So mm -hmm. we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, but anyway, so just putting out there that, you know, of what is a performative, what is a performance, um, but then maybe to go back to then what is curating and thinking about mm -hmm. um, how my career has sort of like, uh, you know, evolved from, thinking of myself as a curator of contemporary art, so really anything made by an, a living artist, to um, following that trajectory over the last 25 years and seeing that um, you know, emergence shift from, let's say, you know, at the turn of the century, you know, between the 20th and 21st century, looking at things like digital media and how that changed contemporary art, and then moving into practices of performance, then moving into um, the interest in pedagogy. So, you know, artists who are very interested in lecture performance as a form of pedagogy, workshops, lectures, um, panels, uh, residencies, uh, you know, the way in which teaching and um, performance might come together. And then really more recently, um, thinking about an area called social practice or, uh, you know, uh, public practice. So, and, and that really, um, in a way, dissolves the object um, and the, the, the public themselves become the object of curating or of performance. Um, and I've been really fortunate to be able to curate all of those art forms uh, in museums in particular, in museums or art spaces. So, um, so hopefully, you know, by the time I kind of give you this little um, uh, compilation, you'll get a sense of the way in which uh, the practice of someone within an institution um, cares for the object of performance. Um, mm -hmm. And those objects will change from uh, people to animals to the public themselves. Mm -hmm. um, okay, Lisa, maybe we'll look at the next slide. Yeah, but, but okay. uh, before, Listen, we, before we move on, I just wanted yeah. to um, just ask a more of a personal question of what drew you to get into curating? Oh, okay, we're talking okay. about a history. I yeah, mean, just yeah, a little yeah. no, bit. Of course, of course. Yeah, there. and that's actually, that's a that's a brilliant and apropos <laughs> question. 
um, because that actually what inspired me was an internship that I did at the, at the time it was called the University Art Museum. And it's now the Berkeley Art Museum, uh, Pacific Film oh, Archive. Oh, okay. Yeah. But I was an, Back when I was you were a, at Berkeley, yeah. Exactly, I was an undergraduate mm -hmm. and actually my roommate, or well, my to-be roommate, I worked at the Art History Classics Library uh, where all the grad students used to hang out. And my eventual roommate was a grad student in the Art History Department. Mm -hmm. She was an intern for Connie Llewellyn, who was a curator at the University Art Museum. Mm -hmm. And she invited me to uh, an artist talk, my first artist talk um, by Jonathan Borofsky. And um, I just ended up like, you know, hanging out at the museum. I went to the poster sale, I went to the openings, I went to artist talks, and I went to, you know, one of my first like avant-garde film screenings. And my senior year, I was a history major, you know, this entire time. Mm -hmm. My senior year, I realized that like, I had enough, I was only taking art history classes because I finished my history major already. I was writing a thesis, but I had finished all my classes. I was taking almost all art history classes and I thought, oh, I could just finish the double major. And then I thought, wow, you know, I could actually maybe think about a career like working in this special space mm -hmm. of the museum. And, and so this idea that I could be a curator um, started, started, you know, at the museum. And I think that's what always has stayed with me is that the special space of being with objects, but also creating experiences for the public um, and the idea of having a mm -hmm. collection, the idea of having a very special space. Um, that's where that's where it started. It just started. Uh -huh. It started, you know, in in a college art museum, and um, and and I was always interested in contemporary art. I guess. I mean, you know, I acquired a history, you know, in in twentieth century, and took lots of breadth requirements in Asian art and uh, photography, and uh, you know, eventually, you know, uh, global arts. But um, but it was always the combination of being in a museum, working with artists, and um, you know, uh, and, and, and then having a practice of writing, I guess, you know, I, I, th I saw interpretation as sort of like the area that I could contribute and I could learn from and that I could, you know, make a, make a difference in the, in the lives of, of, of the public and, and of artists. Yeah. And at the time, it was the old building. A lot of our students have been coming to the current Bamfa building. And the original, or I guess it wasn't the original, but the one that you were working in at the time was up on Bancroft. Um, and it's this incredible brutalist <laughs> architectural piece. Um, but they also, there was a lot of performance too being programmed there. Did, and did you see some of that too? Did you see yeah, ways so, in which the public engaged there? Um, you know, I'm trying to think like, what was the first performance I ever saw that like, you know, kind of moved me. And I, you know, interesting, I didn't engage in becoming a performance curator, mm -hmm. you know, like, like as a thing that I do actually until much, much later until I was at the kitchen. But okay. I, I mean, but you're but you're absolutely right that the University Art Museum um, had a lot of the old the old building, the building on Bancroft did showcase a lot of performance. It's, you know, obviously recognized for the careers of so many Bay Area performance artists, you know, from um, uh, from uh, you know, Teresa Cha to uh, uh, Ant Farm to, um, mm -hmm. you know, current day uh, people who probably just, you know, uh, finished their MFA <laughs> last year. <laughs> So, and it was, you know, known, but, but I have to say that, um, yeah, my, 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 my sort of like love and uh, inspiration and performance art came later. It came later. Mm. You know, I was, I was really just interested in contemporary art. I think that's what, and I, and I, and it, it took a while for, you know, like all the things to fall together in terms of my, my thinking of myself as an interdisciplinary curator and scholar. Mm. Um, but, you know, I love looking at the archival pictures of all the great performances yeah. that took place in that space. And, um, and, and, and there was something about that space too, that was very special, you know, and, and really shaped the way I thought about the presentation of collections, you know, how I knew that on the second floor, there would be, um, I think the second floor was either, let, let's say there was a floor for Asian art. There was a floor for European painting. There was a floor for, um, works on paper. The Hans Hoffmans were always on the top floor. And then the matrix gallery was on the first floor in that kind of little, Re long rectangular gallery right off the gift shop and um, right the, uh, downstairs where the performances took place and the PFA was there was also a big space where um where temporary temporary exhibitions and large sculpture um, right you know were, were placed so so yeah certainly the the space itself was very impactful on me you know as, as an undergraduate yeah well thank you and we'll hold the this ideas of the 
education, the history, all of that as we move forward and, and into your next slides. And thank you. Oh, I, I love that someone posted mm -hmm. an internship at Banff for working on performance. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> do it, do it. <laughs> Um, okay, so the next slide. So again, so I mentioned um, a couple of really influential essays on how I think about performance. Um, you know, John Austin's series of lectures from the 1950s and Dorothea Van Hontemann's response, um, you know, thinking about uh, exhibitions as, you know, speech acts or as world making. Um, she specifically talks about four different artists. Um, let me see if I can see if I remember them all. Uh, Tino Segal, Jeff Koons, oh, two other guys. Um, I'm sure, you know, all of you have it in front of you and remember. Um, but she, uh, and I, I know there were some questions about Tino Segal's work as well, which I'm happy to address in a bit. Um, but she speaks about the possibility of, you know, exhibitions uh, and the, the, um, it, it, let's say so we call it the facilitation or the organization or the you know production of artists as um, infiltrating both the space of the museum but also mm -hmm. then um, directing the public you know to to participate um, in a in, in a changed moment so to speak in, in an experience. Um, this other author John McKenzie has wrote a really interesting book called Perform or Else: From Discipline to Performance and. Mm -hmm. He breaks down uh, performance into three categories, uh, cultural, uh, scientific, and technological. And let me see, did I bring the book with me? Um, I don't think I brought it, but it, and there's a third category. Um, he really focuses though on cultural performance. Yeah, um, organizational, cultural, organizational. Yes, exactly. and technological. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And so in each one of them, actually the word perform means something different. Mm -hmm. So I'll just give you an example, like in cultural, it typically was referring to, again, the live arts, music, dance, theater, visual art, performance arts. Um, and, but in like the corporate world, it'll refer to actually how good you're doing. You know, it's like, are you performing up to standards? Are you um, doing your job right? Are you being a good, you know, uh, colleague and et cetera, et cetera. There are all these, like the whole kind of- um, Metrics uh, driven. Exactly, and, yeah. exactly, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And in technology, the idea of performance is, is somewhat related, I think, to the to, to, to the idea of actually sports performance. It's sort of like, you know, again, it also has to do with a kind of like, like accelerated um, uh, demonstration of, you know, capacity of some sorts. So anyway, all to say that, you know, the word perform means, means multiple things and that it's, there's a, there's a kind of multiplicity to it. And the study of performance therefore also has multiple approaches, um, but yeah. John McKenzie get, does a really kind of nice job of breaking down the different histories and performance studies, um, interestingly enough, he tracks that it actually emerged out of two disciplines coming together uh, through the work of Richard Schechner and Victor Turner, so an anthropologist and a theater artist. Um, and this was relatively recent, probably like in the 80s, and they for, formed the first performance studies department at NYU. Uh, although Richard Schechter came from Tulane, came up to NYU as a theater director, Victor Turner and him used to have all these conversations about what is performance. Other departments have sprung up, you know, at Berkeley, UCLA, Northwestern, Brown. Um, but, you know, that you could actually, um, you know, R Richard Schechter has written quite a bit of performance theory about, you know, what constitutes performance. All yeah. to say that, you know, I would actually then love to hear from you, maybe when we get to the Q&A, you know, in what way, you know, does performance operate like sort of in your either own art making and your thinking and your day to day life and we can we can talk that through a little yeah bit. Okay. I also wanted to say this is a great moment yeah. to plug the project um that Shannon was a big Shannon Jackson a fellow colleague here at Berkeley did um and maybe we could put it in the chat or I'll put it somewhere along or share it with the students or um in terms of performance and it was a great kind of catalog of different terms used in different fields that are specific to performance and how distinct those terms can be can be you know, I, I think what um, Mackenzie did so well was to just highlight that we use this term performance in such a variety of ways and it can really meet, have such different meanings within the context with which we use it. And um, now today getting hopefully, or maybe maybe making it more complex or more um, 
complicated uh, is the notion of performativity and performance and kind of unpacking those two a little bit, I think will be a great theme as we move forward. But yeah, happy yes, as we definitely, get. Definitely, yeah. Mm -hmm. And also just to say that um, Shannon Jackson um, has been a very instrumental figure also in my my work and actually the, the, the combination of performance theory, but also thinking about curating. I mean, she has mm -hmm. written quite a bit about um, social practice and about how that has actually generated a new kind of curator, uh, you know, curators who are actually producers and community activists and who, you know, care for um, different kinds of experiences. And so Shannon's work, her, her, her book, you know, her like book maybe from about 10, 15 years ago called Social Works is really an examination of artists and curators and institutions, you know, infiltrating uh, everyday life, you know, with with a new a new a new kind of art form. And so, um, Shannon created this, you know, glossary and directory with the Pew Charitable Trust called, you know, in terms of performance that Lisa referenced. Um, that is really helpful about you know like expanding this way of thinking about about performance performativity. And, yeah, you know, because even are. within people think within the arts, there would be a, a, a similar understanding. But within the arts, you've got people working with material, material objects. We've got performers, and within that, you've got curators and um, uh, or choreographers and playwrights and performance artists and socially engaged artists. And and there's all these nuanced understandings and um, definitions and um, coming forward, which I love. Uh, about what she created there. And I hope yeah. that we can push that along. And and, and um, oh, I had a question in relation. Oh, how would you oh, your influence of, of your mentors such as Shannon? Oh, did I freeze? Just for a second, go ahead and finish the question. Oh, okay. Um, how do you, like when you started, you were maybe more working with um, the objects in the museum not so much the performances or performed objects and ha and now how would you situate yourself now thinking about these all these turns in in curation um or you is that too hard of a label to say for yourself at this no, time? no 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 um i mean i always like to say that i follow the um path of artists so um it really depends on who i'm working with at the time and i think that i have experience um you know working with artists either in digital media so film video uh web work that i've experienced with artists working in um again you know forms of pedagogy uh and experience you know working in again social practice so you know out in the community mm. um i i like to think of myself as fairly flexible and fairly fluid uh -huh. even though i will say um you know as a, a, a as a scholar um, my work is really interested in the notion of spectatorship and politics of the image. Mm. So, you know, I will lean towards um, like, like a group show, you know, around photography and performance. So, um, I mean, I, 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 it's interesting because again, because, you know, I'm sort of um, still growing as a curator, I feel like, mm -hmm. um, uh, I don't know what the next next right object phase, is or, that, you know yeah, of the curation yeah. but i will say that what what has struck me about especially during covid is um is that people are very important is that somehow the notion of like people institutions of art i mean there's so much questioning around you know inclusion and equity and accessibility and transparency and belonging I, mm -hmm. I, some, some there's something about the care of people that has that has has to do with like where I think curating is is going right now mm -hmm. and so and I and I and I um I'm still kind of like I'm, I'm like you know my head is paying attention to it there's like this like tickle of like not sure what it is but um uh I, I mean all I can say is that you know I, I remain committed to the work of living artists and so mm. it's kind of like you know it's like wherever artists are going is where is where i think i would go mm -hmm. um and, and i'll just say, i wanted to say to the to the class that like even though as you know like, like as scholars and historians and writers you know uh we try to like systematize or regularize or like canonize your work 
your work is by nature interdisciplinary and it's by nature kind of like everything you bring to the object. So, you know, your wrestle is in a way with like just making your work, you know, and, 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 it, and, and you don't have to separate it out. It's like, you know, is it performance? Is it painting? Is it sculpture? Is it film? You know, I think you really just make the work, you know, and then it's sort of on us to help the, help an audience or help the public really understand you know, the complexity and the originality of what you're doing. So, um, so there's an interesting, you know, kind of collaboration between you as artists who make whatever you make, you know, your work, the space of the museum, which is a space of like presentation and a space of public in engagement. And then there's the work of everyone else, curators, scholars, educators who are trying to understand the work of artists. Um, mm. So it becomes this, this interplay between you as the curator, following and attending the art making and, and being um, capacious enough, open enough to sort of meet them. And then you might run into institutional pushback or something if, if there's something that, you know, you can't bring in or it's too messy or, you know, I'd love to talk to you about. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think you know, when we get, you know, ethics, yeah, when you get moving along, you can talk yeah, about. Yeah, when we get to the next challenge. projects, I can definitely talk yeah. about like, you know, places of tension where I have to oh, have a discussion. Yeah, with like the lawyer or like the registrar or something. But mm. to answer your question a little bit more, um, oh, you, you were mentioning that, you know, the interplay. Um, oh, shoot, I was going to respond to uh, also representing the institution. Um, right, you kind of the artist and the institution, the way you're kind of almost interlocutor between the two. Yeah, yeah, de no, definitely. Um, oh gosh, I mean, I definitely had a response to that um, and I kind of lost it because That's I was right. went down the road of um, thinking about different objects. Oh, oh, I, oh no, okay, I know what I was gonna say. Um, so just as there are different, um, you know, whatever genres of artists, there are different genres of curators. Um, mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. you know, some curators are very tied to the object, you know, curators who work in decorative arts, curators who work in, you know, works on paper, or curators who work on photography. They're very based in materiality. And there are other curators like me that are sort of like committed to the artists themselves and what it, whatever it is they make, you know, and there, are, and there are curators who also then kind of try to take a back seat to let the artwork and the artists kind of like um, have, have the space and, and occupy, occupy these. Like, I mean, like, you know, in, in my mind, like a great, a cure, an expert, a, a, you know, beautifully curated show, you shouldn't feel the curator at all. You know, the curator really kind of disappears. And anytime you're looking for like, oh, I wonder what this work is about, you look and there's the label and you read the label and you understand and you move on. And, or like you're walking through a space and, you know, the work comes to you fluidly. I would say that there is another genre of curator that's almost like an artist themselves. So you did do some reading with, um, uh, like Hans Ulrich Obrist, who you yeah. know is in himself a creator and is an inventor, and you know does so much work with living artists, and you know reinvented the you know um, form of the exhibition, um, and and has also though worked with artists like Tino Segal, and then is in, yeah. in the art of art of curating, and done a whole. It was actually from him that I stole the title, A Brief History of Curating. Um, so you know, so all to say that like just because I have a certain kind of like ethics or policy around the way I curate you know, there are many curators who have a very different approach. Uh, so, and in fact, you know, for any of you who might want to go into curatorial studies, I mean, because curatorial study is, is, a, is a pursuit in of himself as, as performance studies is. And so whether you go to a program like, you know, the Bard College has, or, uh, I mean, or CCA, you know, might have a program in curatorial studies. I mean, so there are different ways in which curators can be working. I happen to just sort of have followed the path, you know, as like an art historian, working in museum as an intern, and then kind of working with other senior curators and, you know, building exhibitions and really um, coming to performance uh, through, yeah, just through different experiences and different places I've worked. Um, but maybe we can go to the first place yeah. um, as, 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 a, as, a, as a start to show you. Um, uh, so so um, I worked for six years at the kitchen, um, a, alternative space in New York City that was founded in the 1970s. And it started off actually as a uh, artist run uh, performance space that was committed to showing um, experimental music and uh, video. So that was like their first, so already they were already into an inter inter interdisciplinary um, organization. It was founded by two 
media artists, Woody and Stein of Asalka, who were trained in film and classical music, they grew to expand and included dance and um, like spoken word as you know, the sort of institution evolved and it's still operational today in, um, in Manhattan. And so I started work there in 1999 and I was hired as their media director, which um, encompassed overseeing the video archive, the video collection, their gallery, um, their education program on digital art, and then these conferences on art and technology. Uh, and by the time I'd been there like, you know, four or five years, I started to actually, besides doing discrete, you know, gallery shows and education programs, I started to commission performance because it just felt like that was where, you know, mm -hmm. the audience was, that was where the staff had the most capacity. And that was really kind of like the artists I was most interested in, in terms of, you know, being able to present their work. I mean, they were always connected to visual art somehow, and they were always mm -hmm. connected to video somehow or new media, but, um, but they, but they worked in performance. And so, so, you know, you asked me how did my uh, move towards performance uh, begin? It was really kind of at, when I was at the kitchen working as a curator in a space that could support performance that, and also I had, an, again, a space, might say a, an institution that could support performance because it had an amazing space and it mm -hmm. had an amazing staff that, that actually yeah. knew how to support performance, which is different than supporting visual art and exhibitions, you know, and working with objects. Um, so one of the performers that I was able to work with um, is Joan Jonas, who is, you know, an American uh, performance artist that also is known for her video work in the 70s. And she had performed in the in New York, in, in the US in the 70s, several times at the kitchen. But um, as many of you may know, working in theater uh, or dance, uh, those are art forms that are in the contemporary world are not as well supported as they are in Europe. So Joan Jonas actually was working in Europe for almost 20 years before I invited her back to do a performance um, in New York uh, in, in 2004. So she had an exhibition on view at the Queens Museum and their curator said, you know, she has a new performance that she would love to do and has never been seen in the US. And I said, well, let's, 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 let's talk about it and let's see what if we, we can raise the money for it, uh, which we did. And let's see if we can, um, you know, put it put it on view. And so, in fact, we did present Lines in the Sand, which was a performance that she did with um, two or three other uh, younger artists. And it was originally commissioned by Documenta in Kassel, Germany. And mm -hmm. then, you know, she brought it over here and she, had, she adapted it in some ways for New York. She worked with a different sound designer. And, um, you know, it was really an incredibly uh, beautiful work about Helen of Troy, who she um, kind of speculated uh, actually was a fictitious, you know, start to the Trojan War. And she was also a kind of like a dialogue with the writer, um, it's not Hilda Doolittle, but HD, a, a feminist writer who wrote, you know, or wrote about Helen of Troy. Um, but, you know, Joan's work is very um, kind of imaginative and, you know, it's, it's not necessarily based on fact or fiction. It just kind of like blends it all she performs herself in it. She uses video, live and pre-recorded, and you know it, it has a. It all comes together, but um, uh, it, it's it's never very you know completely straightforward. Um, but what was so great, so and we had a two-week run, you know, so it, it we it ran for probably eight nights, and uh, you know the kitchen's audience was small, you know, about 125 per night, so maybe like a thousand people were able to see it, um, but. It was the performance in New York that really kicked off Jones's Jones like rebirth mm -hmm. of her career, um, and she received you know numerous um, performance commissions after this. She was eventually shown at the Venice Biennial in you know, 2012, I think, um, and it really kicked off a kind of like reemergence of her career, you know, in her in her in her 70s. And so, um, mm -hmm. and the artist that she's recognized for today, you know, again goes went back to the kitchen. And, you know, and, and, I, and I will say that as a curator, one thing I learned at the kitchen was that it doesn't matter if an artist is, you know, young in, in their middle age or um, more mature, we were always interested in showing the most experimental work. And um, I was really just taken with, you know, Joan's kind of like fresh approach to performance. I mean, that she had performed at the kitchen when she was younger was interesting and that the work continued to evolve was interesting, but, um, you know, we were pretty agnostic as far as the age of the artist, as long as the work, you know, had a feeling of like freshness and 
again, this notion of the experiment, that it was trying to do something different. Um, that's what we were interested in supporting, again, across, across genres, so across like music and dance and literature and visual arts. Mm -hmm. um, so do, do you, wanna, you wanna ask a question here? Or I can go on to the next project. Um, yeah, um, no, let's just go on to the next okay. project. It's great to hear about these. And, and, <laughs> and, and, and you know, uh, I'd love to know more about how, what it took to put that up, but let's oh. move on. Yeah, yeah. unless yeah, you want to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, I will say Joan was pretty easy to work with. Mm -hmm. She um, and I did work with her several times afterwards. Like, because I left the kitchen to go to the Guggenheim, which we'll talk about next. But um, she, this, you know, she had very few problems. Like, she had the bench. We had enough cameras and we had enough screens to support her. Mm -hmm. um, we had to bring in some sand, I think. Um, but, but, um, and we also had to sort of pay for her performance. She, she had one collaborator who came from Germany. We, I found her uh, a sound artist to work with. She worked with Steve Vitello because mm -hmm. her original piece, she had worked with Paul Miller, uh, DJ Spooky, and he wasn't available. Um, but Joan was a pretty self-sufficient artist, I have to say. And you know, we raised some money to, um, again, support the travel of her collaborators. But again, I think she was very comfortable in our space. Our production crew was very comfortable working with her. Um, you know, she, she, has a, she had a few simple, objects that she returns to you know she likes to do these mm -hmm. tabletop performances with a camera over mm -hmm. it and um you know she manipulates different objects like a like a map and a, and a small boat and you know she she works with um bells you know you know objects that make sounds and so she had a pretty firm control over the the pieces of the i mean what of the work because the work was already you know conceived uh and the flow of it and oh, so one thing i that was interesting she did ask for and this is what we had to provide her when we brought her work to the, to the Guggenheim as well, she did ask for time in the space. She said, I would mm -hmm, like to have a week mm -hmm. to rehearse it. I need a week to kind of get all my performers. Like, you know, it's, it's a very much a kind of like, it's a 70 minute piece that we have to be completely in sync and comfortable what's next. And it's all, you know, there, there's music, there's spoken word. And so, and that was also what she asked for when she, we asked her, commissioned her to do a work in at, at the Guggenheim. She goes, as long as I can have some rehearsal time in the space itself, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't think I will need much else. So, um, so, so we, so time, time yeah. in the space. So, yeah. yeah. It was time in the space that she needed and she needed, I mean, so, so, so at the, at the kitchen, she didn't need more than a week because she'd already done the work relatively um, recently. And it was with just maybe three other, other performers, but the Guggenheim work was a more complicated work that involved like 16 young dancers and it was in a new space and it was an mm -hmm. older work that she hadn't done in a long time. So we actually had to find time for her after hours in the museum um, for three weeks. So we, mm. we you know, I looked at, I had to look at the calendar and work with like our cleaning crew and work with like, you know, uh, the, the special events department and say, I just need every night that you have available this month um, that you can give me like four hours a night. And, you know, of course I had paid for extra security. Oh no, actually I didn't have to pay for security because I, I was in the, in the, I was able to stay in the space with them. And luckily there were no other objects in the space at the time. Um, Anyway, so yeah, that's so teacher. great that that yeah. choreography of with the institution and all that's yeah. so interesting to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And we're going to yeah. get more into that. So okay. why don't we look at the next work? Um, okay, so this is a really interesting project. So maybe ten years later, um, I was at the Guggenheim, and I had sort of I had actually um, shifted from working in the let's say the main curatorial department to working in the education department, and I was overseeing. Um, what was what were called, you know, public programs. Uh, but because of my background in, you know, media and performance and um, working with artists, I was able to work very closely with exhibition curators on, if appropriate, commissioning work by, new, by art, living artists. So one of the um, exhibition curators I work with is a Mexican-based curator, uh, Pablo Leon de la Bada. And he was really interested. He, he curated and acquired several, a large body of Latin American artists um, for an exhibition and into the Guggenheim collection. And one of them was the Cuban, is the Cuban artist, Tanya Bruguera. And Pablo was particularly interested in um, uh, working with three artists who are, were, you know, were born in various countries in the global South, but actually formed their career and came to live in the United States and, and in, in New York in particular. So Tanya is one of them. Luis Kamniter is another one. And actually he will be the next art wall artist at the BAM PFA. Oh, so you get a chance oh. to see his work sometime in about a month's time. 
Uh, so the uh, art wall for the students is the big wall in the forum um, that where we did the performances at school scores. It's that big giant wall. They call it the art wall. Right, and it's where the right now has a big Carolyn Kent kind yeah. of like black mural, very abstract, <laughs> bright painting. So Louise Kamnitzer will do the next art wall, but he was someone that I've worked with many times. Um, but this other curator also wanted to do a project with him, and then another uh, art interesting artist educator named Pablo Helguera. So. So for Tanya, so Tanya, um, if you don't know her work, or that I saw that Greg posted a really lovely Art 21 uh, documentary about her, uh, she is um, recognized as a you know, political artist, uh, originally started working in video and performance, and then really for the last 20 years has been working totally within the infrastructure of politics, um, such that she, um, uh, you know, she might like form a political party, or she might, you know, uh, mm -hmm. actually try to emulate, you know, what police activity looks like and have like a, you know, a police horse marching through the lobby of the Tate of, of the Tate Modern in London. And what she did, and, and, and also what she's done, she's also done like fictitious um, protests. Uh, so so um, we acquired a work of hers that was called Untitled Havana, where um, uh, within a regime of you know, dictatorship, individuals get up to a microphone and speak about, you know, they, they, they actually speak about what it is to like protest censorship or protest, you know, um, uh, you know, other, other ways in which the government might control your own behavior. So that performance piece was acquired by the Guggenheim and then Pablo wanted to do a new piece. And at the time, and she continues to be very involved with the um, experience of immigration. So, um, so Tanya was pretty taken with the idea of sending a message to the Pope, who is still our current Pope, Pope Francis, who is actually a Latin American, uh, was a Latin American Pope, I mean, a uh, bishop before he became the Pope of the Roman Catholic Church. Um, uh, but he has taken a position about being very uh, friendly to indigents and, um, you know, opening up the church. And Tanya felt that if he could be sent, you know, a message that one way to, um, you know, express kindness and empathy to new members of the church was actually to make all immigrants citizens of the Vatican. So the Vatican is a city or principality that has, um, but you don't have to live in the city itself mm -hmm. to be, to become a citizen and to work there. It's, it's one of those, you know, borderless you know, municipalities, because most of the people who work at the Vatican do not live in the Vatican. I mean, only only the, the bishops and the popes live in Vatican City, but all the service people, all the people who come through, who knows where they live in Italy, they live somewhere, you know, in, in, in Rome <laughs> outside, but they don't, but conceptually, Rome. you don't have to live in Vatican City to become a citizen of the Vatican. So, so she thought that as a gesture, the Pope could grant citizenship to all immigrants because they don't need to live in the city. And so and it just as a, and, and in a way, his message of openness to embrace people in the religion of Catholicism is in a way granting them citizenship into the Vatican. So, so it's, it's a very interesting mm -hmm. like, like reversal or layering of politics and religion. And, and that really is what Tanya specializes in. And so, so what we did, um, at the Guggenheim was uh, Tanya did a performance piece where for uh, the summer of 2014, she um, engaged in a postcard campaign where she was getting visitors to the Guggenheim to sign a postcard. I actually don't have the back of the postcard, but in the back of the postcard, it basically says, dear Pope Francis, we support immigrant, uh, immigrant citizenship. Um, we hope you will grant citizenship to immigrants. So it was a, it was a pre kind of like written postcard they all they had to do was sort of like check a box that either say they support the project or they support you know immigrants being offered citizenship and they sign their name. So Tanya's goal was to collect ten thousand postcards, put them in a beautiful box, and send them to the Pope <laughs> and have them delivered to the Pope. Um, and so you know she engaged in this performance piece. And um, what we, what you actually see are uh, documents of her performing the piece in. Uh, Texas and California, because the piece went to New York, Texas, and California. Um, it, it sort of, she had a sort of like um, different 
exhibitions that were on view that we were able to, you know, mount the performance. And um, the, 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 to get to the question about like the production and the care of, of the performers themselves, um, the care of the piece, um, so a couple of things. Tanya very much wanted a label, an exhibition label to be placed in the museum when she was performing the piece. She wanted it, the public to know that it was an artwork on view, that it was part of an exhibition um, in the museum. And so, so we did put a label up in the lobby of the museum, directing them to the performance. And um, her, her, her approach to, you know, again, a, a tourist coming to see the exhibition, someone who's on the street was like, I'm the artist, Tanya Bruguera. I have a piece in the, in the, in the, in the Guggenheim and I am involved in a postcard campaign. It was a very simple script, but her, her safety net was to say, I am an artist, I have a piece on view. That was always the frame that she presented this performance piece. And, you know, she would come and, and, and talk to us every day and say, well, I had, you know, some really good conversations. I mean, the tipping point was when the visitor or the person signing the postcard came to understand that the political act of supporting immigration was the artwork. I mean, I mean that, that would, it was, it was, that they, if they could somehow like intellectually make that leap, that was what she was hoping for. She was hoping for that, that tipping point of like, oh, okay, I'm, I'm participating in artwork. Oh, but I'm also participating in a political act, you know, and like that, uh, that kind of border between the two or that space between the two or the space of occup occupying both, both uh, acts mm -hmm. was the space that she really wanted to get into a conversation with the, with, mm -hmm. with the, you know, the audience about. And so she would say, some people got it, some people didn't get it. And some people, you know, would say, I like your art, but I don't like your postcard campaign. So yeah, I'm not gonna sign it, but you know, you're a good artist and thanks mm -hmm. for talking to me. Um, all to say that this is obviously a very physically demanding performance on her to be, you know, out there every five days a week, eight hours a day. And so the care of Tanya uh, was, you know, about making sure she had, sunscreen for, you know, an eight hour performance, making sure she took breaks, making sure she, you know, had um, a meal plan. Um, eventually she did engage additional people that were part of her performance team to, um, to do the postcard, uh, you know, signature collection with her. One of the participants actually had like a bad conversation. Like she engaged in someone who became verbally aggressive and, um, you know, uh, was um, criticized the piece, criticized her, and it was you know very just criticized the project, and you know made some other um, unpleasant remarks. And you know she had to um, take a break, take a break from the piece, and so the piece had to be shut down. And you know, and and what I learned was, I mean, and and, and I had to sort of like try to establish a protocol for when the piece was damaged or when the piece needed to like the performer needed to take a break, and I realized that actually to go back to the same protocols in which we would treat an object that had been damaged, if, if like a painting had been slashed or a sculpture was knocked over or something, you know, damaged it and had to be taken off view, we would take it off view and we would put up a little sign that said this work is off view. And so I realized that actually just sticking within the protocols of the museum was important for the care of this work. I mean, I did have a conversation obviously with our legal department and our HR department to say, well, what do I do if someone actually gets hurt? And they're like, well, we will take care of that. I mean, we have, we actually have insurance coverage that takes care of, we, ha we have a, you know, insurance where that takes care of anyone who gets injured. They can go to the hospital, they can, we can call a doctor. So we will take care of the artwork as a person, but we also mm -hmm. need to care, care for the object the mm -hmm. same way in which we care for other objects. So, so it was, it was a really interesting, you know, exercise to figure out like, you know, how do we care mm. for the person? How do we care for the object? Um, and yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah so but great, that was something I learned. Yeah. It's making me think too, you know, when, when Greg and I um, asked our students to, well, we, we sort of made them perform uh, for us in the Alton and Nolden and, and hopefully in the Q&A we can um, maybe have, maybe students might want to speak forward or we'll create a prompt around this. But, you know, there's a certain care we took to try and make it a positive experience, but because it was a graded thing that they needed to do this as an activity, you know, it just, it, it just makes me think of the layers with which you invite yeah. 
an audience or a, a participant in um, an active performance piece. It's, it's, and yeah, um, it's, it's very much it's very much built in to the planning and to the uh, to the thinking to the conception of the piece. I mean, even before the performance happens. You, I mean, so 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 I had to spend a fair amount of time with our internal staff because the staff wanted to know, well, how will we ask answer questions from the public who want to know what's happening? How will we so so we so we had a script, we had prepared a script for them to be able to read about the piece. The people who are participating in the performance also needed a quite a bit of training in advance, you know, and mm -hmm. we also needed to have we had contracts with them, they were paid, you know, they wanted to know. Again, when can I take a break? You know, I mean, and so so it, it was all very planned. And it was all very, uh, what's the word? Not complicit, but um, agreed upon. Um, but but yeah, but I mean, your your questions about participation are are, are right. ethical questions. You know, very much right. so. Or if someone, if this piece, you know, the people signing the postcards become actually part of the piece, and do they realize they're part of the piece <laughs> while they're signing it? And you know. Yeah. Yeah. Are they being well, I think, yeah, so, yeah, and, yeah. I think uh -huh. for that one, we made it clear that like, all we need is your signature and it was your choice whether you wanted to put your email in or not because uh -huh. Tanya wanted to add them to a database that she could keep them updated, but that was their choice. So, so their participation- um, They could kind of in the signing of, or not signing of the cards was sort of a- Had a very discreet beginning and ending. Yeah, yeah. And- um, one thing, one thing we did do. Mm -hmm. So everyone who signed a postcard, uh, they were offered a little tattoo that the a temporary tattoo that Tanya made that was this Pangea that is this, you know, um, map of North and South, uh, actually of the world, you can see it is actually all seven continents are in this uh, Pangea that is um, the map on her postcard. So, so we did offer them a kind of um, compensation for, for participating in the artwork, but their participation was pretty discreet. It was discreet, mm -hmm. it was temporary, and it was um, fleeting in a way. So, so, and, and I think we, we, I think we felt like that was fairly safe, but that might be an interesting discussion. Yeah. Um, so I know oh, that yeah, we, 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 yeah, we've got to move. move. We oh, I can talk to you forever. Let's, <laughs> why let's why move. do I look over the, over the next two projects really <laughs> okay. quickly, and then we'll open it up for, for discussion. Uh, okay. Let's look at the next project. Okay, so um, very quickly, um, I know I mentioned animals as some, some, as an object that I've worked with before curating. <laughs> so this was another project. Um, but the next two projects are part of a initiative that I worked on at the Guggenheim called Guggenheim Social Practice. And it was when I was working on these projects that I got to know Shannon Jackson really closely mm. because she was also writing about social practice as an extension of theater and performance and politics and you know uh, other other disciplines that she was you know working working with visual art and dance and you know rhetoric. One of the projects that was uh, conceived by a collaborative team, Lenka Clayton and John Rubin, who are based out of Pittsburgh, was a project called Circle Through New York. And um, we actually asked them to conceive of a project that involved the Guggenheim um, in some way. And so what they came up with was uh, literally a circle through New York that included the Guggenheim, like they drew a circle, um, you know, in, in on the map of New York City and they invited, I mean, they did all this research, but they invited six different institutional collaborators to each participate in this circuit of exchange. Mm -hmm. So one of the partners was a pet shop in the Bronx and each of the organizations had to contribute an object, an object of their identity that would move between every host once mm -hmm. a month. So the pet shop in the Bronx contributed a very, very valuable and a very volatile and vulnerable uh, object, this you know, exotic Malukin, Malukin cockatoo parrot named Pinky. And Pinky lived in all of the participants' um, home for a month. So Pinky came to the Guggenheim and to um, a Punjabi TV station in Queens, um, a church in Harlem, uh, another institute for the study of the ancient world, and then I oh, and, and a high school. So the picture here ah. is Pinky at the high school uh, as part of a drawing lesson. And so, so, so the work that I had to do with Pinky coming into the museum was, you know, among the most fascinating work I've ever done in terms of talking to, you know, again our 
preparators, our registrars, our legal team. I mean, you know, just bringing an animal into the museum is a big deal. You know, I mean, now it's a little more accepted that, you know, uh, assist, assist medical assist animals and um, other kinds of creatures, so to speak, can come into the museum, whether it's, you know, birds or uh, snakes or dogs or whatever, or cats and whatever. Um, but again, you know, even, even, you know, five years ago, you know, it was, it was a little bit dicey getting an animal in. And then, you know, Pinky had to live in the, in the museum the whole month. I mean, like she would go on view, you know, every day or we would try to put her on view because she was kind of fussy. Um, but, uh, um, you know, so she had a special travel cage <laughs> that came with her <laughs> and it had to be kept warm. And, um, and she had special food and special handlers. And at one point, um, the artist said, well, Pinky should, you know, curate her own film series. I mean, Pinky is a creator in this, in this experience. And so we had a little video monitor where Pinky, you know, what well, ostensibly curated her own film series. But um, so the care of Pinky was, again, among the most fascinating um, curatorial projects I undertook, but it really opened up thinking about, you know, decentering, decentering certainly humans and then decentering art and really thinking about animals as co-creators, mm -hmm. uh, which I think, you know, again, was in line with, you know, this, this interdisciplinary study of the Anthropocene. And so um, it was really a kind of interesting moment where, again, the work of artists pushed us into, you know, more greater humanitarian thinking. So one more project, and then we'll open up to questions. Uh, so we'll look at the next slide. Um, the last artist I worked with in Guggenheim Social Practice was a New York-based artist named Sean Leonardo. And Sean um, is actually known as an educator and as an activist. And he, at the time we met him, he, and he, he actually continues to work with uh, this group. He founded, co-founded um, an organization called Assembly. And this mm. is a arts diversion program whereby uh, a nonprofit works with the uh, civic um, court system and works with youth who have committed um, like felony one, two crimes, but are being, are given the option of an educational participation. And if they participate in this program, they will not have a record. They will not have a criminal record because um, they undertook their, th th this diversion program. So it's almost like traffic school for felonies. Mm -hmm. um, um, and, and so Sean created this project called Assembly at a nonprofit gallery called Recess, where he is now currently the co-director. And uh, we thought that this was an amazing uh, undertaking. He also worked at the New Museum for Contemporary Art as their teen, teen program educator. And then we asked him for a proposal of something he was working on. And he came to us with a proposal called Primitive Games, which was a series of workshops with different groups um, that were all engaged in the handling of a gun. And he wanted them to participate in a wordless debate about gun, about gun, about, you know, touching the gun uh, or be on different sides of the gun. And so we worked with him to do these different workshops uh, that involved um, New York City police officers, military veterans, uh, members of a gun club, you know, recreational users of guns, and then several youth who were in his assembly program. So youth that were impacted by gun and gun violence. And, um, you know, we did a performance at the Guggenheim that was uh, um, based on these workshops that he did with the different participants and, um, did we shift the debate on, on guns? I'm not sure, but um, we certainly created an interesting looking performance <laughs> moment. And, and actually Sean continues to work with all four groups. Mm. Um, so, I mean, and certainly the groups, um, that they themselves, the participants were very, you know, kind of moved and, and changed by this um, mm. activity. And, um, uh, you know, for a moment we brought the, debate around guns into the museum. And we did, we did, we had a symposium afterwards and, and you know, Sean gave a talk and each one of there's each one of the representative groups came and spoke at the museum. Um, but, you know, it was an experiment, you know, and I guess I would just sort of end it on that, like, you know, can art change the world? Um, and I guess I would just answer that question with another question, like, you know, does art need to change the world? You know, and I feel, I feel like for, for like for Tanya's piece and for this piece, 
I feel like if we can engage in the dialogue, that's the way that we're going to, you know, impact change. We're, you know, I don't know if we can commit to change to like curing polio, you know, as a director say, we're not going to cure polio. We're, we, we, we show the work of artists, but I feel like at least we can change the conversation or for a moment, you know, have our art audiences live in the world of debate and live in, you know, rethinking the way they think about, again, immigration or guns or poverty or climate change. Um, Mm -hmm. I think I'll leave it at that. As, as, but that, yeah. that, that. That's where my work is right now, is really thinking about, you know, the ways in which civic engagement can happen in the museum um, and obviously working well, with the staff to do so. So, mm -hmm. Well, thank you for these incredible examples and how lucky we are to have you in the curatorial space to, to you know, bring forth these, you know, help get these pieces into institutions, public places where people can experience them or partake in them or build them with you. I think that's what's exciting. I know that my video is going in and out. So just let me know if you want me to turn off my video so you can hear my audio. I think I have a bad connection where I am, but um, there's a Perfect. question. Okay, just just let me know and I'll turn my, my screen off. But there's a question I think that uh, is kind of great. There's a lot of great questions in here, but um, this one sort of gets at this interesting complex kind of question around what is the sort of the performative which is um well the per performance being more more deliberate more activities that we see um you know that are engaged through kind of a really a conscious action and then performativity um kind of the actions of our lives things that we might not be even realizing that we are performing um codes and and um uh conventions and things that we might not even be aware of that are influencing how we kind of engage in the world. Um, and um, the question is this, um, it's kind of like the question, if a tree falls in the middle of a forest with no one around to hear it, does it make a sound? If a performer performs something without an audience, is it still a performance? Can it be a solitude uh, act or does it have to be a community act? Um, so I saw that question and I thought it was actually, uh, it's almost like a, it's a riddle, right? It's a riddle. Oh, right. No right answer, but I mean, I will a paradox. Give it, well, yeah, <laughs> I will give an example. Um, you know, there, uh, there, there, there are artists who create performances with nobody there other than the camera. Like, so the, an example would be the Cuban artist Ana Mendieta, you know, who created many performances like in the earth, in nature and there was no public there. I mean, there was a camera and she documented herself in performance and that became her object. So in that way, and, and there's been people who've written about, you know, Ana Mendieta's work and like, is it performance or is the photograph the performance and wh wh where is the object, so to speak? Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's one way of answering your question that there does not need to be a public per se for there to be a performance. And, um, uh, the question of um, then, like, you know, who is the artist making the work for? Who, you know, when does it become alive? You know, when does it become a performance? Um, you know, I feel like that that's like a question around. Uh, so, so interesting enough, you know, when you when you um, have a chance, hopefully, to engage with Louis Kamnitzer's work. Mm. One of his interests in creating work is actually not creating an object that is like closed or has all the answers. He actually is interested in the viewer completing the object on their own and having it be, he calls it a secret, a secret the artist will never know. Mm. So um, I guess I would say that like, um, you know, performance exists wherever, um, I don't know, wherever you want it to exist, you know, it, 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 it and, 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 um, but that doesn't mean that it has to be seen by the public. It doesn't mean, and I mean, I think if there is a, someone performing, then, then there is a performance. So, so mm -hmm. it actually does not need to have a public, it doesn't need to be seen for it to be a performance. That's sort of my position. So. Yeah. And it's interesting if we try and extrapolate it out to performativity in a way too, when people who study this might argue that those you know me choosing 
to put on this outfit today and to sit in a certain way. And I'm not conscious of the performance I was preparing for, but it's nonetheless a performance of me iterated over time that sort of makes me me and the choice to have to do what I want with how I look or present myself or my gender to you. Um, anyway. Well, I mean, yeah, so, 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 then, so, then, so, then, so then, you know, just because there's performance happening everywhere, does that mean all performance is performative? You know, is all right, performance, right. you know, creating change or creating impact? Um, and that really, that, that maybe, that might depend upon, on, um, on an audience or on a public or something, you know, but, but again, um, yeah. Or maybe just making, uh, being coming more aware that we're all interconnected and that to do a performance, even if it's to do it alone in a forest somewhere, is still to act somehow in the world and be connected to others who might have maybe witnessed that film or someone who might, um, you might act differently in the world after you've been in the forest doing the performance or, yeah, I mean, these are interesting philosophical questions to unpack. There's a lot more here. Um, Greg, Greg has his hand up. If Greg oh, Greg, go ahead. Uh, I, I, now I'm worried that I, I'll perform someday in the forest and the tree will fall on me and nobody will know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> and, but um, uh, there's a question in the Q&A from Lisa Bloom, and she asks about the relationship between museums, uh, performance, and environmental art. And uh, um, she uh, wrote a book called Climate Change and the New Polar Aesthetics. And uh, one of the arguments in the book is that uh, museums often hesitate to show work about climate change because some of their uh, funding comes from uh, fossil fuel industry. And so uh, that's a very particular question, but, um, uh, and I'd like to hear the answer to that, of course, but uh, we all would. And, uh, uh, but in general, do you think there's cases where performance simply cannot happen because uh, the museum is too too compromised of an institution to have it take place and and you know uh, there's many examples of that as well but let's just leave it with uh with the uh, climate change for now um so so hi lisa and thank you for your question um so your your, your question actually engages in several levels of performance and so i'm going to try to like lay out a couple of them i mean one is um you know, the politics of the institution itself. So, so there's two interesting questions and two things floating around. One is politics and one is performance. So the question actually that I've been engaged with right now with the class I'm teaching at NYU is that like, not only is everything performance, but is everything political, you know? And, I, and, then, and so in this situation, I'm gonna say actually that yes, it is all political and it is all performance. Um, in the specific case of a museum who might want to uh, so, you know, uplift and present the work of an artist who is being critical of an environmental impacted um, uh, natural, you know, whatever, natural state, you know, the, the rivers or, you know, a forest or something because of, let's say, corporate interests. But in fact, you know, the head of the corporation is, uh, you know, a board member or something like that. And like, you know, what kind of, um, institutional politics and performances that engage in, all, all those things are performances. You know, the work of the artist um, wanting to present the work, the work of the curator to vet the critique of the artist, the institution, the internal dynamic of the museum and its director and the board member, um, you know, wrestling with this critique and like, you know, is, and, and then, there, then there's the problem, the bigger problem itself, you know, the forest dying or the rivers, you know, being polluted uh, or whatnot. And like, you know, is in the end, the support of the museum by this board member going to change either the presentation of the work or is it gonna change the work of the corporation that is, you know, destroying the forest or the river? So, so there's many, many levels of politics and performance and, um, I think what I can say as an answer is that that level of like research and stakeholder conversation and um, you know uh, institutional self examination um, is is the work possibly the work of curators now um, and um, I will say that um, 
the recent book that Laura Reykjavik wrote called Culture Strike, where she really kind of actually looks at several recent engagements that museums have had either with board members who were, you know, head of corporations that were supplying the gas, you know, that was um, being used at the border, you know, during, during the Trump administration or with other stakeholder groups. I mean, where Laura was a former museum director um, uh, left her study was that proposing that museums and engage in a practice of radical slowness, that like it needs to really go back and look at, you know, where its funding is coming from. Is that funding ethical? Does that funding get like cleaned up? Does it exonerate the money because it is now supporting the work of artists or, 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 or should it not be taking mm. the money at all? You know, it's like, it's like you know, is, is it a kind of washing, a, laund a laundering of money? Is it a laundering of money if it's supporting, you know? And she talks about the Sacklers, you know, the Sacklers who uh, made so much money off of the opiate crisis. Is it, is it laundering their money if they start to um, create education centers in, you know, the v &A in in London, in the Guggenheim, in New York, at the Metropolitan Museum? I mean, I mean is, is, that, is that a kind of like, cleansing of of this you know profit that came from uh i mean you know the the addiction and and and, and death of of you know millions of of uh patients um so i don't have an answer you know as to like uh how is that how is that managed ethically but i can say that it is all performance <laughs> it all it, it is all certainly a politics of the institution and it can be the work of curators who want to support the artist that is critiquing and, and this is their responsibility to sort of unpack um, unpack all of these performances that are happening, all of these things, all, all of these uh, ways in which actors are and the public and the the our natural resources, which I think of as co as a co-creator of the work and which we're all impacted. So um, I would I would hope that you know that is the work of everyone engaged in supporting this art, this, this work and, um, and the place that's presenting it, so. Well, thank you, Christina, we're, we're just at time, but I just wanna say, oh. you know, um, it has just been an absolute pleasure and honor to talk with you and you just have such incredible depth of insight, so many fantastic ideas to share with us. Um, we hope to have you back in future classes and, um, and also just to say, you know, in your in your sort of question after talking about Shalini Naro's work about does it have impact? And I think it's, be, you know, I hope that this uh, presentation for our students and audience makes manifest the, the, this important role that curators play in really revealing what art can do and finding a place for it and opening um, the doors and being there at night and doing all the work that needs to be done for the work for the artwork to do its enacting. And so, um, yeah, just to say thank you for that. And I think it is a slow, it's a slow <laughs> movement to get there. And it's not necessarily right away or immediate, but it's through these these acts of repeating this over and over and committing to curation and um, committing to uh, allowing more than just um, material objects into museums, allowing the performance and the animal and the nature into our spaces that, um, is our future. So thank you so much. And um, I hope you enjoyed the conversation. Yeah, no, I absolutely did, Lisa and Greg. And thank you to the students who, and everyone who put in so brilliant, so many brilliant questions. And um, I mean, anytime that, you know, you want to talk more, I'm more than happy to, to be back. And yeah, I mean, as Lisa says, you know, I encourage you to go forward with your work and raise your questions and, um, mm -hmm. uh, continue to you know li li to live the questions to live the questions and mm. live it live live in the nuances and um uh you know move forward in that way so thank you so much lisa and greg for the invitation thank and, you uh, really you know the, the hour and a half flew by i know <laughs> uh, i hope the class really gets a chance to you know uh enjoy the space of the museum, enjoy the conversations with curators and with each other. And, you know, and if, and if, and if your work needs to live in the performance, live in politics, you know, let it, let, let it do that. And, mm -hmm. um, and uh, okay. you know, I'd, I'd love to work with you. So <laughs> uh, let's, let, let's just do it all together. So.
Thanks, Christina. Have Thank a good everybody. Thanks everyone. Happy Bye. happy weekend. We'll see you. Thank you for your questions. In-